Uh, first of all, I would like to greet Sir Lawrence Friedman for gracing us here in Riyadh and at the King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies and sharing with us uh, his knowledge on a very interesting topic. Uh, I would also like to greet the audience and welcome them in attending one of our ongoing series of public lectures that, and we hope that this will be a very informative evening for everyone. Um, I'd like to also give you a brief introduction about Sir Lawrence Friedman. Uh, he was a professor of war studies at King's College, London from 1982 to 2014 and was vice principal from 2003 to 2013. He was educated at Whiteley Bay Grammar School and the universities of Manchester, York, and Oxford. Before joining King's, he held research appointments at Nuffield College, Oxford, IISS, and the Royal Institute of International Affairs. In 1996, he was appointed official historian of the Falklands campaign in 1997. And in June 2009, he was appointed to serve as a member of the official inquiry into Britain and the 2003 Iraq War. Lawrence Friedman, or Sir Lawrence Friedman, has written extensively on nuclear strategy and the Cold War, as well as commentating regularly on contemporary security issues. Among his books are Kennedy's Wars, Berlin, Cuba, Laos, and Vietnam, published in 2000, The Evolution of Nuclear Strategy, Deterrence in 2005, the two-volume official history of the Falklands campaign, and many other books. And his latest book, which will be the topic of this evening, is The Future of War, a History, published in 2017. Um, before I give you the podium, I'd like to just inform uh, the audience about two issues. The lecture will be organized as follows. Uh, the lecture will be given 40 minutes, after which uh, we will open the floor for 40 minutes of Q&A, in which I hope people will keep their comments uh, or questions concise and brief, after introducing themselves, of course. And I also request that everyone keep their phones on silent, uh, so as to not disrupt the lecture. Um, the floor is all yours, Sir Lawrence. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me to lecture here. I'm honored to be here. It's a country I've long wanted to visit, and I'm very grateful for the welcome I've been shown and the opportunity to discuss the changes underway in both the kingdom and the region. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to do tonight what uh, authors tend to do, which is to talk about my latest book. Uh, the future of war has been the subject of many books. There are many, Google it, you'll find plenty of titles. Um, and so when I was asked to write one of my own, I thought it would be interesting as a preliminary to look back at how, how well previous authors had done uh, with the same subject. It soon became evident that the answer was not very well. By and large, predictions had not been accurate. That in itself is not shocking or surprising. It's very hard to get the future right, not least because it depends on technological developments, but also decisions not yet taken by individuals in top positions who will face some fateful moments of choice, and even by multitudes as they respond, for example, to economic hardships. What interested me was that a study of how this question of the future of war had been addressed uh, uh, illuminated a lot of the assumptions of the time, what people thought about their adversaries, about their own societies, how wars could and should be fought, uh, and what difference new weaponry might make. Further furthermore, when people were writing about the future of war, they were usually making a point about the present. These books were about preparedness, identifying enemies, urging more resources for defense, reform of the armed forces, encouraging bold thinking. Alternatively, there were warnings about the dangers of war and the dire consequences for people and property and even whole civilizations if another one was allowed to get a grip on the great nations of the world. So the book covers a lot of ground and I just want to highlight uh, a few themes this evening. In particular, I want to consider uh, the shift away from a classical model of war according to which political disputes could and should be decided by means of battle, to the messier forms of warfare that confront us today. I also want to look hard at one of the legacies of this classical model, 
which is the continuing belief in an opening surprise attack as the best way to win a war before it gets a chance to become too messy. Before I get on to that topic, it's important to note that by far the majority of modern wars arise out of internal conflicts within states. These are often states that were subject to colonial rule until quite recently and have struggled to create better conditions for the people and institutions that might enable them to resolve disputes. Such states can be consumed by violence, and this violence may take most lives not in direct fighting, but in the indirect consequences, such as increased poverty or famine and disease. Such wars often prompt external intervention by like-minded militants supporting a religious or ideological cause, neighbors with local interests, and major powers acting out of humanitarian or security concerns. At times, external forces have sought to hold the ring or monitor a fragile ceasefire in the guise of a peacekeeping force. Sometimes there was no peace to keep, and external intervention effectively took sides, either by preventing one side from winning barbarically or ensuring that the most ideologically sympathetic party came out on top, but uh, as the UK and the US attempted in both Iraq and Afghanistan. On the ground, instead of being fought by disciplined regular forces serving the purposes of either the state uh, or its challenger, civil wars often pitted relatively disorganized militias against each other. In these cases, the conflicts tended to be driven by ground-level considerations of individual and group security, and the violence was often more personal. They broke up communities that had previously been apparently harmonious, for example in the Balkans, and left legacies of bitterness, division and impoverishment. Whatever the higher cause they were, that were notionally being supported, individual and groups could develop their own agendas, sometimes geared to criminal activities such as smuggling and trafficking in drugs, natural resources and people. These interests could keep a conflict bubbling along despite the efforts of mediators or armed peacekeepers. Outside powers and international organizations have come in response to some of these challenges to accept quasi-permanent roles in the politics of host countries and some continuing responsibility for pacifying hostile elements. So one of the important questions for the future of war concerns the readiness of countries to intervene in civil wars. Sometimes they will feel that they have no choice because this is their neighborhood and it matters who wins or because the fighting is generally disruptive, for example, in refugee flows. But unlike the 1990s, humanitarian motives may not be enough to ensure engagement. That may mean conflicts that do not spill out of their borders will be left alone until exhaustion sets in. It will also continue to be the case that those intervening will wish to limit their liabilities, confining themselves if possible to air power and perhaps special forces and advisors on the ground. But also that in the end, success depends on what is done on the ground as much as in the air. Those who hold the territory tend, in the end, to have the greatest political say. And so interventions really depend on the quality of local allies and the ability to get a functioning government addressing the challenges of reconstruction. The long-term success or failure of interventions tends to be closely related to the quality of these local allies. Another observation that flows from the experience of contemporary uh, warfare is the blurring of boundaries. These are the boundaries between peace and war, the military and the civilian, the conventional and unconventional, the regular and the irregular, the domestic and the international, and the state and the non-state, the legitimate and the criminal. Some of this reflects the interaction of civil wars with regional and great power politics, of which I've just spoken. Another reflects the concerns about the consequences of all-out war, and therefore a search for actions that can stay below that threshold, um, that stay below that threshold that might spark a major war. This, of course, began with the Cold War when a superpower confrontation looked too dangerous. We can now see how countries have searched for ways where the subversion of the political process, economic coercion, cyber attacks, 
or brazen disinformation campaigns to influence events while keeping their own liabilities limited and risks managed. The difficulty is that these methods are unlikely to bring much to a conclusion, but instead encouraging niggling persistent conflicts until at some point a way is found to sort out the underlying issues. Alternatively, some spark can move them out of this grey zone and back into more open and dangerous warfare. Now, a key reason why there has been a reluctance to push war to its limits, especially by the major powers, is the prospect of nuclear escalation. Atomic bombs introduced at the end of a war that had seen the Holocaust, carpet bombing, and attacks from long-range missiles appeared as a logical culmination of what had gone before. They were also apparently brutally successful in bringing a total war to an end with Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The simplest of depressing assumption was that war had become progressively more murderous with ever more sophisticated means being found to slaughter people on a large scale. And the future wars would be even more intense and existential. This prospect, it was this prospect that encouraged great caution, even when it came to quite minor crises. The risks of a nuclear calamity were just too great and reliable offensive strategies were out of reach. This caution came to be internalized by successive generations of world leaders. So another question for the future of war is will this last? In the past, credibility about any war going nuclear depended on the likely passions raised by the preceding conventional campaigns in which many would have already died. There is now much less of a connection between the two types of war. The trend in conventional war, at least in the West, has been increasingly to adopt strategies that have sought to spare civilians, though of course not always successfully. But they don't deliberately go out to kill large numbers of civilians as a matter of policy, as was done in past wars. The United States and its allies have been also been confident enough in their overall strength to see nuclear weapons as a reserve, deterring extreme actions by another nuclear power. But under the strain of war, attitudes could switch, as they've switched before, into a position where the old arguments about getting at governments through their miserable populations will appear credible as again. And we've seen this uh, recently in Syria. Or at least uh, the, the use of, uh, of harsh methods to uh, suppress a population. As we see at the moment with President Trump and North Korea's Kim Jong-un, with some leaders the possibility of nuclear use appears larger than with others. Countries lacking comparable strength conventional strength to the US will also continue to see nuclear weapons as a vital leveler, note the extent to which President Putin refers to them um, when uh, in the context of Ukraine. There are scenarios, these are scenarios separate and perhaps from a great power conflict which could also see nuclear use, for example involving India and Pakistan. In addition, a number of the big crises of this century have had a nuclear dimension. The US coalition went to war against Iraq in, tar in, part, in part to preclude a, nu a future nuclear program. They threatened war, imposed sanctions, and eventually cut a deal with Iran to prevent them acquiring enough enriched uranium for their own nuclear weapons. And they're now seeking to stop North Korea taking its already advanced nuclear and missile programs further, though facing a risk of nuclear retaliation if they try to preempt. If and when nuclear weapons are again used in anger, all we can be sure about is this will affect all subsequent discussions on war, either because it was as bad as feared, or alternatively because it helped one side come out on top. And this leads on to another key question. How much will the United States play a role in future conflicts? It's hard to think of a single development that would transform security calculations around the world, including whether or not to build nuclear arsenals, than a decision by the United States to disentangle itself from its alliance commitments. This is why allies 
spend so much time following Washington security debates, which is particularly difficult at the moment, uh, and wondering how much they could continue to rely on the United States uh, to support them in a crisis. Any discussion about the various maritime challenges posed by China to the Japanese or by Russia to the Baltic states takes on a completely different light should these challenges come to be seen also as tests of the principle of alliance. In this part of the world, we've already seen the consequences of a greater wariness about taking on responsibility for regional security. But the United States remains the only power with a truly global reach and conventional forces. But though it can no longer assume straightforward victory, even in battles fought on its own terms, American forces have been blown up by hidden roadside bombs, but it's a long time since they faced serious threats from the air, possibly Korea in 1953, or expected to lose ships in a confrontation at sea. Russia may still pose a serious threat, but only so long as it does not stray too far from home territory. But its economic weakness works against it becoming an even greater power. But so long as it maintains internal stability, China can expect to get stronger. That's why, when coupled with the complexity of its own regional politics, Asia provides, it seems to me, a much more likely setting for a great power war um, than uh, other regions. That's which is not to say it's likely, only that it's more likely than elsewhere. Now, having sort of set a, a broad context, I want to look harder at a particular theme that struck me as I wrote this book, and that's something uh, about the persistence of the idea of a surprise attack um, a, 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 as a move that, if well executed, can in a short period transform international politics. Sudden, at one moment, a state believes itself to be at peace, then suddenly finds that it is at war. It's also in agony, embarrassed that it has failed to pick up the enemy plot and now suffering the effects of blows from which it will be hard ever to recover. And dramas along these lines are played out not only in the worst-case scenarios of military planners and alarmist commentators, but also in movies and novels. They offer a compelling narrative the most powerful are humiliated, and the course of history altered as one state sees possibilities for action that its victim misses completely. It's also credible, as there have been surprise attacks throughout history. There was always a military point, as it was going to be difficult to defeat a strong opponent unless the first, blokes, first blows were telling and really made to count. And if you're going to get in the first blow, then maximizing operational secrecy is essential to maximizing operational success. Surprise, however, only makes sense when the first battles can be decisive. Otherwise, the effect is to start a war with all the pain, risk, and uncertainty that entails without ensuring victory. A decisive victory is one that really forces the enemy's hand. And an important legacy of the Napoleonic Wars was the convic conviction that such a victory depended on the effective elimination of the enemy army. Surprise could make the critical difference when two essentially symmetrical armies, very similar in tactics, organization, and armament, faced each other. Catching an enemy, uh, enemy that was unprepared with an early blow uh, from which it could never really recover, even if it tried to fight on, should allow the whole business of war to be concluded quickly. I go back to the 1870, um, 1870-1871 Franco-Prussian War, to, uh, which underscored um, for, a whole, for the generations leading up to the First World War the importance of early battlefield success. The Prussians were only surprised when the French, having declared war, were slow to mobilize. But they didn't make the same mistake. The efficiency of the mo their mobilization caught the French out, leading to its defeat at Sedan at the start of September 7, 1870. And this represented thereafter the ideal campaign, quick and truly decisive, 
spoilt only in this case by the refusal of the French population to accept the verdict of battle until their unexpected resistance was crushed. Field Marshal Helmut von Moltke showed how to do modern war and its successes in the German general staff took note. To win a war, it was necessary to mobilize early and strike hard and fast. This moment is important in my book because the shock of German victory led to specul speculation about how other powers might be caught out by a ruthless and resourceful enemy, uh, including the United Kingdom. Um, and this led to books about imagining how other great powers might also suffer their own uh, sudden and catastrophic defeats. An early example of this genre um, was a book called The Battle of Dorking, um, written by a British Army officer. Those of you who know Dorking will know how unlikely that sounds. Uh, the book appeared in 1871, just after von Moltke's victory. It described a German invasion from across the channel with telegraph cables cut to present advance warning and the Royal Navy, which had allowed itself to become overstretched because of colonial commitments, losing its warships to, quote, fatal engines which sent our ships one after the other to the bottom. The drama concluded with a last stand on a ridge near Dorking in southern England, where a brave combination of regulars and reserves were let down by the army's miserable organization. And so the accumulated prosperity and strength of centuries was lost in days. A once proud nation was stripped of its colonies, its trade gone, its factories silent, its harbors em empty, a prey to pauperism and decay. That's a very dramatic suggestion of what a cleverly conceived surprise attack might accomplish. Of course, as with so much writing about future war, this was essentially making a point about the present. In this case, the need for army reform, uh, and it was a statement about what could happen if sensible measures were not taken urgently. Other books that followed on similar themes were about the dangers of spies, or ready young, young men for the demands and sacrifices of war, or sometimes in counter-narratives to the gloom, demonstrating how a brave nation could cope with all these challenges. By the start of the 20th century, what writers were exploring new military uh, possibilities opening up with new technologies such as heavier than air flying machines. The imagination of the British novelist H.G. Wells even stretched to atom bombs. They're called atom bombs because of H.G. Wells. A regular theme in all this literature was the importance of surprise and the first blow. The key to victory was seizing the initiative. There were those such as the Polish banker uh, Ivan Bloch, who understood that even the cleverest plans might fail, that defences might cope better than supposed with dashing attacks, and that a defiant population might resist foreign occupation. Still, the Germans opened the First World War with an ambitious, ambitious offensive designed once again to defeat France quickly. But this time they failed. Instead of a decisive victory, they got caught up in a long, attritional slog in which they struggled to cope with the superior economic and demographic strengths of their enemies. After 1918, alternative routes to a quick victory were sought. One possibility was using tanks to revive the possibility of rapid offensive. But there was another alternative that dispensed altogether with a land invasion. This was because of the sudden emergence of aircraft as weapons of war. Instead of forcing the enemy government to capitulate as the result of the annihilation of their army, it would now have to surrender because of the demands of a desperate population unable to cope with a succession of massive air raids and being hit by high explosives, incendiaries and poison gas. A new dystopian literature quickly developed, telling of the trials of ordinary people as they fled their burning cities or of the hopelessness of governments in the face of weapons that they were unable to counter. Let me give you some of the titles of these books. The Poison War, The Black Death, Menace, Empty Victory, Invasion from the Air, War Upon Women, Chaos, and Air Reprisal. Now, Air Raids did not provide the opening shots of the Second World War, but they soon came and became regular 
and progressively more destructive. Yet although their effects were certainly distract terrible, they were not decisive. The resilience of ordinary people and of modern societies had been underestimated. Only with the war's finale and the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki was the deadly promise of air power realised. Previous air raids had killed as many, more, uh, but this time the devastation required only single weapons and the impact was emphasised by the surrender of an already beleaguered Japan. The prospect that the next war could go nuclear inevitably dominated strategic debates after 1945. But what that might mean was shaped by the trauma of the two surprise attacks that had uh, brought first the Soviet Union and then the United States into the Second World War in 1941. These attacks pushed the logic of seizing the, the initiative to the extreme. Hitler la launched Operation Barbarossa in June 1941 uh, against uh, the Soviet Union while he was still fighting the British Empire. The Japanese attacked the United States Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor despite having failed to pacify China. These were both enormous gambles, bold in their execution, complete in their surprise. They were both characterized by arrogance for their leaders were convinced that their nations were superior in spirit and discipline, and also recklessness in taking on much larger powers before existing enemies had been defeated. Both gambles failed. The Soviet Union was rocked and at one point looked like it would succumb, but it held on, and gradually the size of the country, its harsh climate, reserves of strength, and Nazi mistakes, uh, turned the tide of war. There was never much chance that Japan would conquer the United States. Uh, the aim of the attack was to get in the best position for what was assumed to be an inevitable war. The result was a terrible conflict with great suffering, ending with Japan under American occupation. The most important lesson was that getting in the first blow, however well designed and executed, did not guarantee victory. Yet for the victims of 1941, the basic lesson was that great power um, did not provide immunity from surprise attack. The United States and the Soviet Union won in the end, but their fights were long and painful. The results were not preordained. The shock effect was substantial and left a legacy uh, in the way both thought about war thereafter. One does not have to dig very deep to see the ling lingering impact of these shocks in the current security debates of both Russia and the United States. This was especially evident at first when it came to nuclear strategy. In the United States, the dominant fear was that the Soviet leadership might become convinced that a well-crafted first strike would put it in a position to fear retaliation. Starting numbers were irrelevant if the US could be disarmed by a surprise Soviet attack directed against its bombers and long-range missiles. In the 1960s, the Americans set a test for the US nuclear arsenal. Could it assure destruction of the Soviet Union, defined as the ability to maintain at all times a clear and unmistakable ability to inflict an unacceptable degree of damage upon any aggressor or combination of aggressors, even after a surprise first strike? This was put at 33 to 20 percent of the Soviet population and 75 to 50 percent of its industrial capacity. That is after the United States had had its own nuclear blow. That was the nuclear blow that could come back in retaliation. So this is, these criteria assumed a pain threshold well above the losses it experienced in the Second World War, uh, which of course had not been willingly accepted. Then the highest possible intelligence assessments about future Soviet capabilities were taken to see what, if anything, needed to be done to continue to assure destruction. And the answer was not a lot beyond continuing with the existing plans. Now, this wasn't a prediction of future war or how the American government would actually cope with a complete failure of deterrence. The aim was to leave the Soviet Union, Soviet leadership, in no doubt that aggression carried an unavoidable risk of nuclear devastation. 
What could not be done was to guarantee this American response. And that was because the Soviet Union could also, even after absorbing the first strike, ensure similar levels of destruction of the United States. Hence, mutual assured destruction, naturally known as MAD, came to describe the standoff between the nuclear powers during the Cold War. How much this contributed to the fact that it didn't turn into a hot war remains a matter of conjecture. There were many reasons why political leaders would have been desperate to avoid a third world war. But the possibility of mutual destruction was hardly irrelevant. It was not necessary to gaze for long into a crystal ball to see the awful devastation with which a future war might end. Would the Germans and Japanese in 1941 have really been so ready to launch their wars if their crystal balls had shown them how bad things might turn out? The point of deterrence was to persuade a potential adversary not to bank on the first move being decisive and to think through the consequences of an enemy still capable of fighting back. Establishing that there was no sure way to win a nuclear war did not end all fears. The Soviet Union kept on building uh, its own arsenal, suggesting that it had a different view of how deterrence might work, which might include even some plan for a nuclear victory. Even if it was the case that mutual assured destruction meant that the arsenals neutralized each other, the Soviets strengthened conventional capabilities, provide them with other op options for mischief. This left plenty of scope for inventiveness when it came to imagining how Moscow might take an initiative that would catch Washington unawares and so allow it to steal some geopolitical advantage. One scenario actively debated in the 1970s was the possibility of a sudden and vast Warsaw, Port, Warsaw Pact offensive into West Germany, requiring little prior mobilization and so no practical warning to NATO about what they were about to face. This was a sort of worst case in which everything was assumed to work perfectly for the enemy while NATO was left flat-footed, overwhelmed before it could consider even escalation to nuclear use. Yet even when wars did open with surprise attacks, the results were not always encouraging. Israel's demolition of Egypt's air force on the first day of the June 67 war was one example where the enemy was left helpless by a well-executed attack. Although this war also demonstrated how conquering and occupying another's territory could lead to persistent terrorism and insurgency. Two prime examples of surprise attacks that failed to deliver early victories was North Korea's move against the South in 1950 and Iraq, Iraq's against Iran three decades later. North Korea might have succeeded had not an international coalition managed to come to the aid of South Korea before it was completely overrun. Iraq found itself struggling to cope with Iran's counter-invasion and was caught in a war that lasted from 1980 to 1988. Uh, Iraq struggled for most of the 80s to avoid being overwhelmed. Its, resul its resultant uh, impoverishment, indebtedness, was one reason for its next surprise attack on Kuwait in August 1990. The occupation was easily accomplished, but it barely lasted six months. Kuwait was liberated in, under an American-led coalition, which Saudis were very much involved in early 1991. By and large, as I mentioned already, the most striking feature of modern wars is not how quickly they can be concluded, but how long they last. The United States achieved quick victories in Iraq and Afghanistan against regular forces, but then got bogged down dealing with insurgencies. Russian aggression against Ukraine allowed it to take Crimea in a surprise attack very quickly, but it's still bogged down in eastern Ukraine uh, in an inconclusive struggle. Syria has become an arena in which a whole series of regional conflicts have played out without without a route to anything resembling peace being identified. As I've noted, with civil wars, the typical conflict now lasts years, long after the economy, society, and political system have been broken, with the violence sustained by criminals uh, 
as well as zealots, warlords and neighbouring states. Well, for these reasons, when thinking about war, major powers now appear tentative and unsure, even when, as with Russia, they, tend to be, they seem to be taking bold steps. Their objectives turn out to be limited. There are no longer grand victories in mind. Instead of audacious moves geared to quick victories, the alternative approach can now be seen in China's probing, patient approach to its disputes in the South China Sea. Yet none of this has erased concerns about surprise attacks. One reason is the recollection of Al-Qaeda's attacks on New York and Washington on 11th of September 2001, after which commentary in the US soon turned again to Pearl Harbor. And the lesson lay not in the revenge taken against Al-Qaeda and its Taliban sponsors in Afghanistan, but the shock of discovering the vulnerability of open societies to malicious attack. The aim seems simply to be to cause maximum, pa maximum pain. And that soon led to speculation about the many ways in which pain might be inflicted. Scenarios were now constructed in which small terrorist cells or even lone wolves could harm using basic weapons, guns, knives, high explosives or vehicles, aircraft or trucks, turned into lethal weapons. Attacks of this sort could not bring a modern Western state to its knees. At most, they were part of an ongoing and largely uncoordinated global insurgency of indefinite duration. Despite the obvious differences in scale and impact, this was as true of a Taliban ambush in Kabul, a shooting in, Par in Kabul, a shooting in Paris, as it was of 9/11. So all of this needs to be kept in mind when addressing claims about future surprise attacks that are now suggested will come out of cyberspace with, uh, with effects of cyber attacks equivalent to defeat in war. As early as the 1990s, the growing dependence of vital services on digital networks led to warnings of an electronic Pearl Harbor directed against the critical infrastructure supporting energy, transport, banking, and so on. Instead of trying to get quick victories by taking out enemy forces, why not instead take out the enemy society? While the technical issues are quite different from the more classical forms of military attack, and the practice certainly less violent, there are similarities to the post-1918 claims about strategic air power providing a more satisfactory route to victory than attritional fights between, enemy, between armies. As with a nuclear first strike, the best case for the perpetrator requires confidence that preparations for an attack are not detected, that the appropriate networks are properly, can be properly identified and then attacked, and that the cyber attacks will work then as planned. And even then, as with Operation Barbarossa and Pearl Harbor, there is the question of what happens after the first blow. How would this turn into a lasting political gain? A cyber attack does not lead to territory being occupied. The victim can be expected to respond, even as they struggle to get the lights back on and the systems working. An attack that produced drastic effects, really drastic effects, could be considered a casus belli and classical military spot responses might be considered legitimate. The issue is not whether critical infrastructure can be vulnerable and lead to major upset if taken down. Hostile activity in the cyber domain, represented by continuing offence-defence duels, is now constant and ubiquitous. It involves activists, terrorists, criminal organisations, poses constant headaches for those uh, trying to preserve the integrity and effectiveness of vital networks. The danger, however, is not so much of some one-off catastrophic surprise attack, but a series of events in line with modern conflict, reflecting the blurring of the military and civilian spheres, efforts to weaken and subvert opponents without attacking them head-on. These are wars with occasional military strikes and battles, often vicious but still short of being truly dis decisive. Cyber attacks represent another way to cause injury and irritation short of obvious acts of war, as well as serving as natural accompaniments to acts of war, but they're not necessarily a route to victory. <laughs>
There's therefore a disconnect between the continuing su a search for a route to a decisive victory and the contemporary experience of warfare, which is that once started, it's hard to stop, and that even if enemy regulars are overwhelmed, the result is as likely to be insurgency, especially de if directed against foreign forces. There's always an argument in thinking about the future of war, for test thinking about how the resilience of systems can be tested against the worst case. And that's the value of a lot of the sort of literature I describe. Uh, if it's possible to cope with the most severe threats, then they should be able to manage lesser cases. The worst case may depend on the aggressor being foolish and futile. But then another's stupidity is one of the hardest things for any intelligence agency to predict. At the same time, when planning an offensive, it is the case that somebody, that, that a planner, will want to make the first blows count. My key point, however, is that even with surprise and maximum effort, and maximum effort these first blows are only rarely decisive on their own, especially against an opponent with reserves of strength. That is why it's necessary to look beyond surprise attacks to what follows, to the second and third blows, and even to those much further down the line, perhaps delivered by irregulars who have taken over the struggle after the defeat of the regulars. The most challenging aspect when entering a war, and I say this as a member of the UK's Iraq inquiry, the most challenging aspect when entering a war and a regular source of failure and tragedy is the difficulty of thinking about the moves that will need to be made after the first, the ways that a conflict might develop in ways that lead to consequences far from those originally intended. The surprises of war do not just come at the start. Thank you. Um, I think this, the time is up, and this concludes our lecture for this evening. Uh, I would like to ask everyone to join me in thanking Sir Lawrence Friedman for a very informative lecture. And thank you very much, and have a good evening. And please join us in many of our other public lectures in the future.